These are words by Elizabeth Lerner McClay. As drops of rain that find each other and build to become a track, a rivulet, a stream, a river, a sea, so are we drawn together. So are we fortunate to find each other. So are we bound together on this shared passage toward an unknown ocean and eternity. This is our sacred time together to pause and reflect on how we can nurture our connections so we can be stronger and more balanced together. Let's take in a deep breath. and center ourselves for today's worship. Our chalice lighting words for this morning are from Kenneth Patton. We are all things, all persons, full and famished, good and bewildered, sly and honest, frightened and less frightened, killer and slain, the rapture and the enraptured, youth and age, male and female, <clears throat> baby and corpse. Excuse me. We are all things, <clears throat> excuse me, tree and flower, moss and grass, mammal and reptile, bird and insect, the creature that is life is apart from nothing that lives. Please join me in reading our covenant in English and in Spanish. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is his prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, thus do we covenant. La doctrina de ese ingleses es el amor. La búsqueda de la verdad es su sacramento. Y el servicio es su oración, vivir juntos en paz, Buscar el conocimiento en libertad, servir a la comunidad en comunión. Este es nuestro pacto. Now, if you have your hymnal, you can turn to 207. It's the gray hymnal, or the words will be on the screen.
have some words here. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I needed this written down. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm Linda Fitzgerald, your worship associate this morning. I'm so happy that you've joined us both virtually and in person. We have a crowd here today. This is wonderful. For 65 years, Emerson has been a beacon of liberal religion in the West San Fernando Valley. We acknowledge we are located on the land of the Chumash, Tongva, and Keech, people's land which remains part of their lasting identity and heritage. Our existence as a spiritual community can never fully be understood without appreciating the depth of loss of their land in generations past and the enduring hopes for the renewed vitality of these, these cultures in years to come. Emerson is a welcoming congregation and a sanctuary of love. We are happy that you're joining us here today, whether it's your first time or the many, many times you've been with us. You are very, very welcome. This morning, I'm pleased to be the worship associate for our own Melissa LaRoque. Her husband, David, submitted a short bio. <laughs> Dr. Melissa LaRoque is a licensed professional clinical counselor, mother of two daughters, and Unitarian. She has been a member of Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church since 2013. Melissa got her PhD from Ohio University. She works with adolescents and adults experiencing anxiety and depression. Born in Parkersburg, West Virginia, she grew up in the mid-Ohio <clears throat> Valley, but moved to California in 2008 after selling a used CD through Amazon.com to a recently divorced guy in Encino who found her irresistible. <laughs> <clears throat> this is Melissa's first sermon. She is excited to share some insights she gained from Sean Aker's work. Welcome. <clears throat> <clears throat> This week, we have been witness to continuing devastation in Ukraine <clears throat> by a tyrannical dictator. We marvel at the courage and determination of the Ukrainian people and their president. At home, we watched the Senate confirmation hearing of Katanya Brown Jackson. <clears throat> and to one of our own phenomenal American women, we heard what is being called the most shameful display of political bias ever. Despite a long list of credentials, Jackson has faced a barrage of questions from Republicans trying to brand her record as soft on crime or entrenched on liberal activism. Some Republicans continually interrupted Jackson's responses to their question or yelled in their arguments against her confirmation or credentials. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham stormed out of the hearing, and Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton called her a liar during their questioning. But finally, we heard Cory Booker, who praised Katanya Brown Jackson for her incredible grace and poise in the face of such an onslaught of the cruel slandering of her record 
her character and her value as a person. Booker ended his speech by calling Jackson his harbinger of hope. He, he said, this country is getting better and better and better. When that final vote happens and you are sent on to the highest court in the land, I'm going to rejoice. The greatest country in the world, the United States of America, will be better because of you, end quote. In the words of the UUA's own Tanya Marquez, for a long time I have believed that the sacred can be found everywhere, that every time I find it unexpectedly, I am filled with awe and surprise. And every time something like this happens, it makes me wonder what sacredness in life I have overlooked, thinking the space was too ordinary, too familiar to be holy. May our hearts be always open to see the holy everywhere we are. And may we be filled with joy and awe when we find sacredness in unexpected moments and places. Welcome to this sacred space. If you're attending via Zoom, please stay online for conversation and connection after the service. Thank you. Also, if any of you have a joy or concern you would like to write in the Book of Life, you can put it over there and we will share it later. <coughs> I actually had to Google how to say this person's name. <laughs> Um, it's, this is one of my favorite books. It's The Little Prince, and it's by, by Antoine de saint Exupéry. Mm -hmm. Hope I said that correctly. So this is a story about a little prince who has a rose uh, that, begin, that began to grow on his planet. It's a very barren planet, but he doesn't know how to take care of her, and she's very demanding. So he ends up leaving his planet to try to learn how to care for her and figure out the feelings that he is having. He eventually comes to Earth and what happens, uh, he eventually happens upon a garden of roses, which was quite shocking because he had thought that he had the only rose in the whole world. But then he became sad thinking that she is just like all the other roses. Then, that is when the fox appeared. Good morning, I am over here, said a voice, under the apple tree. Who are you, asked the little prince. You're very handsome. I'm a fox, said the fox. Come play with me, the little prince suggested. I'm so sad. I can't play with you, the fox said. I'm not tamed. Oh, excuse me, said the little prince. What does tamed mean? It means to create ties with, the fox answered. To me, right now, you're just a little boy, no different from a 100,000 other little boys, and I don't need you, and you don't need me either. I'm nothing to you but a fox like any other 100,000 foxes, but if you tame me, we'll need each other. You'll be the only boy in the world for me. I'll be the only fox in the world for you. I'm beginning to understand, the little prince said. There's this flower. I think she has tamed me. If you tame me, the fox said, my life will be filled with sunshine. Look at the fields of wheat. I don't eat bread. To me, wheat is useless, but your hair is the color of gold. So it will be marvelous once you've tamed me. The wheat, which is golden, will remind me of you. The fox fell silent and stared at the little prince for a long time. Please, tame me, he said. I'd like to, the little prince answered. What do I have to do? You have to be patient, the fox answered. First, sit down at a little distance from me like this on the grass. 
I'll watch you out of the corner of my eye, and you won't say anything. Words often lead to misunderstandings. Then each day you can sit a little closer to me. The next day, the little prince came back. It would have been better if you'd come back at the same time, the fox said. If, for example, you come at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, by 3 o'clock, I'll start feeling happy. The closer it gets to 4 o'clock, the happier I'll be. But if you come at any old time, I'll never know when to prepare my heart for rejoicing. So the little prince tamed the fox, and then it was time to leave. You look like you're going to cry, said the little prince. Yes, of course, the fox said. Then what's the point? The point, said the fox, is the color of the wheat. That's my secret. It's very simple. One sees clearly only with the heart. Anything that is important is invisible to the eye. Anything that is important, the little prince repeated so that he wouldn't forget it, is invisible to the eye. It's all the time we've, you've spent on your rose that makes your rose so important, the fox said. Once you've tamed something, you'll re you're responsible for it forever. You are responsible for your rose. And now we are responsible for our affirmation. <laughs> so, let's do our affirmation together. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. This morning's offering words are from Kayla Parker. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively do greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. We give in love and in hope. Thank you for your generosity. The ushers will now take the collection. I was trying to see if I could look in the chat. Hmm. You know, I think what I did was I, um, I got on video instead of phone. So I'm not sure if I can access the chat right now to be able to see if there are any, um, does anyone know if you're on your phone, if you can access the chat, if you're video, you can? Oh, more. Oh, wow. 
wow, okay. <laughs> All righty. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's take a moment to anchor. Okay, uncross your legs, get comfortable while sitting somewhat, somewhat upright. You can soften your gaze or close your eyes. Breathe in. Hold that breath for a moment. And breathe out. Relax the little muscles around your jaw, your eyes. Relax your shoulders. Feel your sit bones sinking into your chair. Feel the earth under your feet. And take another deep breath. Every one of us is a part of a web of life that makes us one with humanity, one with all the universe. We are grateful for this connection as it strengthens us all. Each week we share our joys and concerns. You can write them in the chat too. And in our book of life, Eric Schmidt writes, my joy is I never ate kale until my daughter-in-law, Robin Lolly, turned me on to green smoothies. Put some kale into blender with pineapple juice, blueberries, chai, or flax seeds. Really great drink, and you don't have to cook kale either, and you don't have to take, you don't have to taste kale. Banana is an extra ingredient you may add. Thank you, Eric, <laughs> for that delicious tip. And there's lots of kale if you've come to the sanctuary to take home with you. <laughs> uh, Clinton says, my longtime supervisor, David, is battling with cancer that's spread to his lymph nodes. He'll be meeting with his team on Friday. Sorry to hear that, Clinton. Bess will be sending lots of healing energy to him. David, to David. And someone has written, think of Pat Cosgrove, who is with his sister Lisa in a hotel near City of Hope while she recuperates from treatments for advanced cancer and awaits further procedures. Christine wrote, may Jennifer recover and return home. Susan Siskin wrote, my son Jake turned 25 yesterday. I can't believe my baby is now a quarter of a century. Some sorrows are too raw to speak aloud. If you are holding someone in your heart this morning and you want to send them healing energy and loving kindness, you may write their name in the chat or you can call out their name as I ring the singing bell. Joe Donna Earth, my friend Brian, who is undergoing chemo treatments, Ukraine.
May the arms of this community hold us. May the love and compassion we experience here ripple out beyond these walls, touching all who are in need. Let's come back to our breath and prepare for our hymn, Our World, 134 in the Gray Hymnal. Our world is one world. This reading is uh, by Diane Ackerman from The Rarest of the Rare. Leafing idly through the home planet, I stop at a picture of Earth floating against the black velvet of space. Africa and Europe are visible under swirling white clouds, but the predominant color is blue. This was the one picture from Apollo missions that told the whole story. How small the planet is in the vast sprawl of space. How fragile its environments are. Seen from space, Earth has no national borders, no military zones, no visible fences. Quite the opposite. You can see how storm systems swirling above a continent may well affect the grain yield a world away. The entire atmosphere of the planet, all the air we breathe, all the sky we fly through, even the ozone layer is visible as the thinnest rime. The picture eloquently reminds us, one, that Earth is a single organism. said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn, and we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them, and we help them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know I'm who I am today because I knew you. Like a comet 
ripple from orbit as it passes the sun like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood who can say if I've been changed for the better but because I knew you been changed for good and while they be that we will never meet again in this lifetime so let me say before we part so much of me is made of what I learned from you with me like a handprint on my heart and now whatever way our stories end I know you have rewritten mine by being my friend like a ship blown from its mooring by a wind of the sea a seed dropped by a sky bird in a distant wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? But because I knew you, because I knew you, I have been changed for good. And just to Forgiveness for the things I've done you blame me for But then I guess we know there's blame to share And none of it seems to matter anymore Like a comet will flew a show of it As it passes the sun like a stream that meets a boulder Halfway through the wood Who can say If I've been changed for the better I do believe I have been changed for the better And because I knew you This month, the theme is balance. And balance is defined as an equal distribution that allows us to remain upright and steady. And so often, finding balance can be a struggle. As a licensed professional clinical counselor, many of my clients find themselves working long hours and running out of time and energy to spend on friends, family, and even themselves. We are wirelessly connected to other humans and pick up on how they are feeling through empathy, compassion, and understanding. Our brains are designed to mirror the behavior we observe in others. Research shows that watching a single cold remedy commercial can actually lower our immune response. <laughs> and it's true. Another study put an undercover researcher among people at an airport waiting for a plane to arrive. The researcher began to nervously tap his foot and start looking at his watch. And um, within two minutes, the people around him started shifting uncomfortably from foot to foot. 
and started looking at their watch. Also, the converse is true. An undercover researcher begins to laugh in a crowd. And pretty soon, it spreads, causing smiles and laughter. According to Sean Aker, uh, he's a psychologist and the author of The Happiness Advantage and, the, and Big Potential. Social connection is the greatest predictor of happiness. In fact, Aker says that this is as predictive of how long you'll live as obesity, high blood pressure, and smoking. A crucial part of living a balanced life, one in which we can remain upright and steady, is through positive and healthy connections with others. Our seventh UU principle is respect for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. I happen to really love this principle, but it's usually not how our society views the meaning of our existence, or at least our success as part of our existence. We are taught to compete in order to rise above the herd, to be the very best. We teach our kids to be independent. In schools, kids do homework alone, projects alone. For the first 22 years of our lives, we are judged solely but we are by but we alone can achieve. But after that, our success is almost entirely interconnected with that of others. So it is wise, wise to strive to work well with others. The formula, be better, smarter, faster, more creative than everyone else and you will be successful, is one that our society pushes. But is that really true? It is not the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the best fit how well we integrate and connect with others. In his first Star Wars script, George Lucas originally wrote, may the force of others be with you. Hearing this, I'm a bit disappointed by the truncated version. It takes away the vital statement of our need for connection. And it's interesting that Han Solo Solo is an I don't need anyone, is strengthened when he joins the resistance and falls in love. As a little girl, my favorite movies were, and actually still are, The Wizard of Oz and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Both movies had some super scary parts in it, but each movie had profound messages. With the Wizard of Oz, we learned that Dorothy had the power to return home all along and how important her friends and family were and that they were actually with her every step of the way, but she didn't know it. And in Willy Wonka, Charlie returns the everlasting gobstopper back to Mr. Wonka who says, so shines a good deed in a weary world. This redeems Charlie, who had broken some rules before and is invited to take over the Wonka's, Wonka's business and move his entire family there. I became a huge fan of Gene Wilder as a child. So when I finally saw the movie The Little Prince, although I didn't particularly enjoy it, I don't know if anyone saw the movie, but um, this was the 1974 like, version. <laughs> um, I couldn't appreciate all the, all the songs and especially Bob Fosse's long dance number in the desert. It was so boring as a kid. <laughs> but I, inf I fell in love with his portrayal of the fox. It impacted me to think of how our connections with another being can create a sense of responsibility. I love the idea of having a routine meeting with a friend so one could get exciting, excited leading up to it. In The Little Prince, the wheat fields now carry new meaning for the fox because they remind him of the little prince's hair and how being tamed, creating ties with others, positively transformed his life forever. And that is why it is so important to make these connections. We can be transformed forever by being tamed. And as Elphaba and Glinda noted in Wicked, because they knew each other, they were changed for good. Despite Zoom meetings, social media platforms, and other high-tech ways to communicate and connect, we seem to feel increasingly disconnected. 
This was written about back in 2000 in Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone. That book discussed how we barely know our neighbors anymore and how since 1950, there has been a reduction in in-person socialization, so socialization, which he posited helps educate and enrich the foundation of our social lives. No doubt, these are even worse, uh, things are even worse today with our social connectedness. Sometimes these platforms designed to connect us can often have the opposite effect. Many of my clients express feeling jealousy, envy, and even depression that they aren't matching the glamorous accomplishments of their peers. Theodore Roosevelt once said, comparison is the thief of joy. So when sucked into social media, I recommend setting a timer for 20 to 30 minutes and then moving on to something else or do a digital detox and take a break from all the platforms. Rather than focus on, focusing on what we don't have, a scarcity mindset, I encourage clients to see what abundance that they have in their lives and is what is going well. That way, when we see others' successes, we can choose to feel happy for them, knowing we too have things to be proud of and grateful for. In my counseling practice, Your Highest Self, I encourage my clients to work on reaching out to previous support circles and reconnecting with old friends while also making new friends through joining a group, a club, or a spiritual community. Positive human connection greatly enhances our mental and physical health. And it is an, an important part of my clinical intake process to, to assess which support systems do you have in, in your life? Having a support system makes a huge difference on a person's mental health. Sean Acor's research found an easy way to increase our connection, which also increases our happiness. So take a maximum of two minutes each day for the next 21 days to text or email someone a compliment or an expression of gratitude for something very specific. And he noted to be mindful of how we praise others. Instead of saying, you're the best player on the team, say, you're a strong player, or you have a fierce swing. Saying you're the best minimizes the value or efforts of the rest of the team. By taking two minutes each day, perhaps first thing in the morning, sets up your day with positivity that can radiate out, likely it will make that person's day, and they might respond, which in turn makes us feel good. So we can keep those positive dopamine hits coming. This also works to rewire our brain so that we can think a lot more positively. Many clients express extreme discomfort in receiving compliments and often immediately discount it or minimize it. But I encourage them to just say thank you and rather than, uh, rather than tearing it down. Akers suggests that when we receive a compliment to think, who helped me get here? Or who helped me achieve this? So you can choose to refract the compliment because we often have a support system that has helped us get there in some way. So allowing others to share in well-deserved praise lifts up, lifts up us all. Most people are familiar with Ner Newton's first law of motion. An object, that stays in, an object in motion stays in motion. But let's not forget what else Newton stated. Unless acted upon by an outside unbalanced force, many things in our life are out of our control, perhaps none more so than the moods of other people. We frequently meet outside forces that knock us off track and make us unsteady. While we have no control over the emotions and actions of others, we can do things to help ourselves remain upright and positive, which in turn positively influences those around us. According to the analysis of researchers Fowler and Christakis, this is pretty interesting, if you become happier, any friend within a one mile radius 
will become 63% more likely to also become happier. If you surround yourself with happy people, it improves your chances of happiness. Aker noted that the second chapter of the first book of the Bible and the Torah states that man is not meant to be alone. But this wasn't specifying a gendered need for Adam. Traditions in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all point to how we need community and that loving others is the heart of religion. Aker says that the upper limit of our potential is predicted by the people that surround you. Motivational speaker Jim Rohn intriguingly said that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So it is important to surround yourself with people who motivate, inspire, and lift you up. Aker suggested creating a Venn diagram, you know, those big circle things. Asking, who leaves me feeling good? Who strengthens me? Who makes me hope for more? Whichever friend or family member checks up all the boxes in the center is usually self-aware, compassionate, optimistic, resilient, and present. Surrounding ourselves with people who lift us up improves our mood and uplifts our lives. Even the works of our favorite authors can be positive influences. Research indicates that we can take on the traits, the traits of the main character of your favorite book and that this helps mold us into our highest selves. So my friends, it starts with you. Finding the balance and interconnectedness, finding those supportive, positive people in our lives can improve our health and well-being. And nurturing those connections lifts and empowers those all around us. Let's be a positive force to each other so that we can gain or retain our balance. Now we're going to be uh, looking at or singing our last hymn in the Teal Hymnal 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place.
is one world. What touches one affects us all. The thoughts we think affect us all. The way we build our attitudes with love or hate, we make a bridge or wall. So as we leave this sacred space today, let's build more bridges, be responsible for our foxes and roses, hear our voices in each other's words. Then our heart and all hearts can be in a holy place. May the force of others be with you. <laughs> Amen. Namaste. Peace.